ads for the purple pill and preventing acid reflux. But do we really know if these pills have a value in preventing esophageal cancer? Well, acid that refluxes into the lower part of the esophagus can cause heartburn and can lead to ulcers. But there's some thought that it might be related to precancer and cancerous conditions of the esophagus. So tell us about Barrett's esophagus and how that relates to cancer of the esophagus. Right. Well, we're really talking about hiatal hernias. A hiatal hernia, by definition, is when the opening between the stomach and the esophagus, where there should be a valve that's small, and that opening is too wide, it can't close all the way. And when it can't close all the way, then when the stomach has its peristaltic activity, it pushes the hot acids and whatever else is in it into the lower end of the esophagus and can damage it. That can cause a change in what the lower end of the esophagus looks like. It actually turns into mucosa, into tissue that looks more like the intestine than the lower end of the esophagus. So when that happens, usually it's caused by bile that refluxes from the duodenum, which is the first part of the intestine, past the stomach. So when bile goes the wrong direction, it gets in the stomach and there's a hiatal hernia there, it can get to the lower end of the esophagus and if it's there long enough, it causes these changes that we call Barrett's esophagus. So that's what Barrett's esophagus is. So the lower part of the esophagus looks like the intestine. Exactly. That's why it's called intestinalization of the lower end of the esophagus. It doesn't have that nice epithelium. So do we know what causes the bile to go backwards, to come back up and start Not really. Going down? I don't think we understand that. It's, uh, it's something we have observed. We know that when it does that, that's what happens. The actual mechanism that happens, people are discussing, but it's not clear. So should people that have Barrett's esophagus be afraid of getting cancer? Yes, in general that's true, because some people who have Barrett's esophagus will get esophageal cancer from it. But it's only those people, for the most part, that have abnormal changes in the cells that are in Barrett's esophagus. That's called dysplasia? Right. So if you have dysplasia in those cells, you're the kind of person that's at risk for developing esophageal cancer. Now, most people with esophageal cancer don't have Barrett's esophagus at all. So just because you have Barrett's esophagus doesn't mean that you're going to have a problem with, with esophageal cancer. The acid is the other issue that comes up. What does the acid do? In my opinion, it causes the burning pain that we see with the acid indigestion that we call reflux. And that causes the ulcers and, and all the things that go with that. So I don't think it's what causes cancer because if you look at the fact that aspirin is given to people and the incidence of esophageal cancer goes down, it really doesn't make sense. It should be that if you cause more acid indigestion, that you're going to have a higher incidence of cancer. So it's something else. So what do you think is the best way to treat this? So let's say somebody's diagnosed with Barrett's esophagus or Barrett's uh, uh, dysplasia uh -huh. or adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. Okay. How do you feel is the best way to treat it? And how does this study talk about how to treat it? Okay. Well, in general, the medical profession, being conservative and wanting to save as many lives as possible, generally does too much. So we tend, if there's a bear, if there's a bear, if someone has a hiatal her hernia first, we tend to look down there, you know, put an endoscope down there, and see if there's a Barrett's esophagus there, and take a biopsy and see if there's dysplasia, and to see if there might be an early cancer or a more advanced cancer there. In the people who just have Barrett's esophagus by itself and no dysplasia, you don't need to do anything to try and treat that. But you could use some things that help protect the lining against the contents of the stomach that reflux into the lower end of the esophagus because that valve is too wide. I bet you're going to say DGL. You got it. It's, it's a licorice root extract. And what that does, in contrast to the antacids, is it coats the lining of the whole gastrointestinal tract from the mouth to the anus with a thicker mucus that protects that surface from anything that comes into contact with it. I wonder why Western medical doctors don't just do that routinely. Logically, they should, but you talk to them about DGL, they don't even know what it is. And they because just they're tell not them to take them. the purple pill. Well, you don't want to blame the doctors for that because their training says that they should be using the purple pill. But the problem with the purple pill 
is it has lots of side effects. It increases your risk of osteoporosis by about almost 50% after a couple of years. The risk of senile dementia goes up 18%. You won't absorb iron or magnesium or calcium very well. Uh, and you may even get addicted to it because if you take it for more than eight weeks, the body tends to want it to stay there to keep extra acid from being produced when you stop it. So it's not a big panacea, not a great choice. But if you can do natural things, the DGL is good. A probiotic is good. L-glutamine is the major metabolic fuel of a lot of portions of the gut. A good idea. And if you do the natural things that we all know about for hiatal hernias, like don't eat before bedtime, don't eat big meals. Have uh, your head elevated. And yeah, you're going to probably do pretty well. So what do you do? Those are the simple things to do that always should be, should be done first. And then you want to do the things that are a little more aggressive. And if you do know you have a hiatal hernia, you are, are having reflux esophagitis, it may be a good idea to have a gastroenterologist at least once look down there and see what, what, what he or she finds. Well, they have these scopes now that go down your throat and yeah. your esophagus, mm -hmm. and they can look around and take videos and take samples, sure. and it, it has a light on it, and they know what they're doing, and they can even do surgery that way. Yeah. Where it used to be that it required a major surgery that well, was very invasive. So we have come away, but sometimes they tend to overdo it, I guess. Well, they, they tend, we tend to do too many things thinking that we're better to be safe than sorry. But as it turns out, it doesn't look like it really is. So like any situation, you have to look at each person as an individual. You want to look at their situation from the point of view is of what's the risk for them developing uh, a complications that's serious, either from the treatment or from the disease. And when you work that out, chances are you're going to be treating people individually with a lot of thoughtfulness and get the best result that's possible.